Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Mashrik Bank webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to be moderating today's discussion. My name is Diala. Um, and today we're going to be talking about digitalization uh, and the future landscape of commodities trading and how digitalization has impacted uh, that. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Stefan van Eiken, who is from Unipro Global Commodities, Mr. Morgan Eldred uh, from Digital Energy, and Peter Maguire from XM Australia. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I'd love to introduce um, Mr. Badr Chowdhury, who is Senior Vice President, Sector Head for Energy at Mashrik Bank, our host for the webinar today. Uh, and I'm going to now go to, to Badr to, to give us uh, two minutes of his opening uh, remarks. Thanks, Badr. Thank you so much, Diala. Uh, and thank you so much uh, to the, our guest speakers. Um, it's um, our pleasure to have you join this uh, forum with us uh, to exchange your views, uh, your insights, um, and your sort of visions um, that you foresee for the, for the industry that um, is much closer to um, your, your, your eyesight and your horizon. Um, let me just start off with, uh, with our perspective as a financial institution. Uh, where we have observed uh, in the last two years the rapid uh, transition um, of digitization across the entire uh, business matrix, uh, be it uh, you know the financial institutions, um, the government regulatory bodies, uh, you know your your other counterparts, and the entire supply chain and ecosystem. Uh, the reason why we felt that we would appreciate the views of, of your um, prospective industries is to understand how this transition has progressed, um, where have the challenges been, where do you see this evolution continuing in the next 10, 15 years, um, and how um, if players like uh, Mashrik, which are a key component of the commodity uh, trading cycle, uh, mm -hmm. can continue to play a part in the evolution of this particular um, industry uh, sub-vertical. Um, I will uh, sort of summarize uh, my sort of, um, sort of position uh, on this particular matter by saying that uh, financial institutions have always been uh, partners in the evolution of trade uh, from the very beginning uh, of, of globalization uh, with respect to integration of, uh, of, uh, of the requirements of corporates uh, with, with, uh, with, the, with the key uh, sort of deliverable being um, customer satisfaction and uh, speed of delivery of services. Uh, and that remains our main objective to deliver. So we, we, we welcome your views uh, with respect to the evolution in this space and uh, to contribute uh, our sort of observations and our efforts in this respect. Uh, over to you, Deala. Thank you, Bedra. Thank you very much uh, for that. And I, I might just come back to you with, with a couple of comments and a question first. I mean, you mentioned, you started by saying the last two years we've accelerated into more innovative digitalization and its impact on the finance industry and obviously we're talking about the trading industry and commodities today as well. Would you, why are you specifying the last two years? Are you, are you referring to COVID or are you referring to the fact that the whole momentum of digitalization, which, was, which has been with us for a few years, uh, has, has really accelerated in the last two years and perhaps been triggered by economic events around us? So I think there, there are two angles to it. Uh, um, there is, of course, the uh, COVID impact uh, and the wider economic uh, sort of impact as a result of that. Why, uh, why is it the last two years? Is because the last two years has provided the requirement or the, uh, the, the impetus for the entire ecosystem to adopt to digitization. And that has always been the challenge for evolution of every, any industry, is the adoption of a new way of doing business by all the constituents of the industry. So they've always been early adopters uh, and then there are laggards. 
the last two years has made everybody come into the same platform and invest and try to you know make it work as i say um and that is where i say that the last two years has seen that growth um i could for example uh, sort of uh, provide uh, sort of instances where we've seen that transformation it's where uh, in the recent two years we've seen regulators saying that yes we need to make the entire experience of uh, banking um seamless so from mushrik's point of view for example we have initiated what we call mushrik neo and digital account opening platforms for our our clients now that proposition goes out to our clients who can then cross position that with their with their you know suppliers with their counterparts regulators have then asked us to consider for example the uh, uh, electric uh, electronic uh, kycs right which again uh, it brings in an, a very important angle of trade finance because compliance as you know is a key component in that respect so that's what i say that the last two years has bring brought everybody on the table try to find solutions which uh, are sort of linked with the entire value stream of a particular industry okay great yeah and of course you mentioned trade finance which obviously mashrik bank uh, operates on in, in big volumes and that of course thinks back to supply chain and, and all the all the conversations we've all had about trade and the disruption in trade flows this year because of covid so all of that obviously is going to be impacted by uh, you know more efficient systems and the solutions towards that are going to speed up uh, thanks better peter if i can go to you first um uh as the commodities trader extraordinaire if you like on our panel today and just just kind of take a step back and ask you a general question uh on 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 how much do you think you know we're we're again in the in the start of or in the midst of one could argue a, a new commodity super cycle yet another one uh some people say it is or it isn't but how much um is this new cycle let's say the latest one that we're in uh and we are seeing commodities increasing in value every day in the last few months how much of that is is due to digitalization and efficiencies and confidence in these new systems and solutions that that you as a trader and others have at your fingertips or is it just a coincidence with the fact that we're we're, we're seeing you know real physical demand on the ground okay well the other uh, i think where does one start first off i don't believe that the commodity super cycle that we entered in around about 01 or 02 went away i think it just went on a little bit of a vacation we saw that was very evident in the late teens in the sense of 17 18 and 19 we've seen very strong demand with all of that stimulus led recovery that tens of trillions of dollars spent globally and the impacts as far as inflation i think this decade will be just well beyond our even our imaginations as far as base metals and just the demand picture throw in a, an extra probably billion people inhabiting the world over the next 12 to 15 years so that adds even more demand so i think this cycle they say goes for 22 to 28 30 years as a typical cycle I, i spent time with jim rogers discussing this in person i think this cycle will probably run up to four decades And so, so why be on you Yes so, so as you said it's in your opinion it's continuing it's running it will it will have its peaks and troughs how much yep. then is the use of big data and the efficiencies of accumulating information uh, into systems into smart systems having an impact on the commodity world today Well I think it's having a big impact I think from a trading perspective you know you're getting more information to be able to digest that and you know from machine learning artificial intelligence you name it and to make decisions with a far more uh focused eye and hopefully from a speculation standpoint and that's the side that I'm on um you you're trying to outthink the market and that really is the nuts and bolts and I'm even at a even pointier end I'm at the retail side so the retail investor is looking at how do they outthink a market how can they take advantage of opportunity both across the commodity and the fx space so Yeah, I think uh, collaborating, machine learning, expert advisors that they use as far as algorithms. The other it's a very very learned world out there and many 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 people millions across the world are inhabiting it and joining it by the week. 
Okay, thanks, thanks, Peter. Uh, Dr. Stefan, to go to you on on sort of a similar point, but I mean, we've seen, as Peter was saying, that this this commodity super cycle has not just started, and it's it's going through its ups and downs. In the last decade, we have seen, you know, uh, but a sort of explosion of of volume of trade in commodities and the whole mm -hmm. within the whole commodities ecosystem. Uh, and of course, the data within that has has increased and has become more available. Um, so again, same kind of same question to you. Um, how much would you say uh, in, in the Uniper trading world, if you like, data availability, uh, you know, automated um, decisions being made even for traders on their desks? How much is that impacting the volume of commodity trading and and the accuracy of it? Um, mm -hmm. I think I think it's hard to say how much it really affects the volume, but um, we just see that it's happening. So that the trade number increases, the data availability increases, and it puts the trader in a position where if we don't use the future or the, the available technology, if we if we are not preparing ourselves, if we are not really picking up uh, quickly, we eventually are overrun by these data. It's just becoming so much that um, there, there's so much data, there's so much information in there um, that a human person, just as a human person, you, you can't digest that anymore. So we envision uh, more, and uh, I think this is not really revolutionary. That's why I really like what Bada said. It's about an evolution. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what we also often say in Uniper on that top matter. Um, we think that the traders will evolve in a way where they are orchestrating algorithms. So they're actually working with algorithms. It's not um, often, from, from my personal perspective, it's kind of a misperception when people think it's, we have algorithms there and we have no people there anymore. I don't think this is gonna happen. Someone still needs to be clever and think about the algorithms. And then all these algorithms have simplifications. They're never perfect. <laughs> they have data flaws and all these kind of things. They're using limited data. And someone with a human brain needs to orchestrate these algorithms and decide when to use what. Mm -hmm. And I mean, now that you brought that point up, it's something that I wanted us to discuss, but we'll, we'll, we'll mention it now. The, the human resources, obviously, the, mm -hmm. the aspect, the skill set to manage this, these algorithms, clearly they're being created by people who are very competent, but then they're being brought in to systems within Uniper and uh, Peter's company and, and Morgan will talk to you soon about sort of the more physical space of, 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 of commodities, if you like. Um, how much, how important or how, how is the transition to get the people skills able to adopt, if you like, these. And surely there have been challenges on that front and, and costs as a result. Yes. And uh, actually, you know, um, what I've been doing the last uh, couple of years is, is transformation programs and in particular now on um, the, the trading field now. And well, on the outside, we call it digital trading, algo trading or, or something because it sounds good. But in the end, it's a transformation program. And it's very much about helping our staff, our people to develop. So you can't buy the people on the market. This is not, I mean, of course we are hiring people as well here and there, but there's a very high demand, very high competition in the market for the expertise. Um, and we have excellent people in our company that we, uh, that, that have the market understanding, the trading know-how, they, they know how the markets work. They just need to develop in the new world and be enhanced, let's put it that way, to work in these more technology enabled work. And this is now possible because everyone talks about data democratization, I think is kind of a, a word that everyone loves. Um, I personally think we kind of have a democratization of programming or machine learning or something. It's like clever people that they don't need to be mathematicians or programmers to actually develop simple parts themselves with certain programming language. And this, I think, looking back the last couple of years, the last two years maybe, this has significantly changed. With programming languages like Python, a lot of people, and the libraries behind it, this is very significant, very advanced libraries are behind Python that you can use. And if you use them, a trader, say, you, you can teach a trader in, in a day or something to do basic stuff. And that I, is changing the game completely. 
and technology Absolutely. is changing our lives at, at, at uh, you know um, incredible speeds every day on every front. Peter, I see you sort of nodding in agreement there. Um, would 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 you, it sounds like it's a positive thing from what Dr. Stefan is saying. Uh, any any challenges to the speed at which this is all happening, uh, both from obviously skill sets being able to understand, uh, and but but you know, even from a corporate point of view. Uh, do we have the buy-in, if you like, from the C-suite to bring in all this technology and they're, go they're having to revise their business models as a result? Oh, I think they're bringing it in very, very quickly, Diallo. They're, they're well and truly ahead of the band. But just from just building on what Stefan said, you know, the likes of MATLAB and these sort of things, a library of information out there. And what he said, you know, you can teach someone in a day, Python and the, just the the vast amount of knowledge, but how simple it is to just, it's a bolt on. And anyone that's got a degree of hunger, and I think that's the key. It's its a little bit like an entrepreneur. It's like, you've got the hunger to succeed. You've got, I've got traders all over the world that are hungry and they're hungry for information. They're hungry for knowledge. And once you couple that with someone that's got, you know, this library of information, the rest is anything can take place. And that's truly what this offers. It, it's just a, a this this decade is going to be groundbreaking. I mean, and Dr. Stefan said we still need people, no matter how much technology and digitization solutions we bring in. But there is Absolutely. there are certain obviously trading um, functions that that I mean, everything happens on a computer already. But but you know again, uh, you know sort of trades that are triggered automatically by certain. Uh, positions put, etc. We've had that for, for a long time. But is there a risk, Peter, of like hyper liquidity, or what people are calling hyper liquidity, i.e., just too much going on too quickly, uh, you know, and, and losing control? Uh, is there any risk on that? Well, there's a great amount of risk and building on what Seven said as far as slippage, you know, from a retail perspective. That's why yeah, you need to be yeah. watching the screens. You yeah. need to be conscious that, hang on, we didn't get out. Well, it gapped. What happened? I mean, you know, we're out, aren't we? No, we're not out and we're, it's in free fall. So what happens? What's the, you know, you can have the best algorithms, but you've still got to keep an eye on the market. And that's what the retail traders do. They work in a collaborative team across the, across the planet. You've got guys that have got, you know, four and five different people working together and just, that's how they trade. This is quite a science. It really, it's, it's, it's just sensational to watch. And uh, yeah, there's some very, very smart people out there that are self-taught and they're the ones that uh, I think will do very, very well out of it from a financial side. Uh, and, and causing a lot of disruption at the same time as well. Morgan, uh, again, welcome. Morgan from Digital Energy. Uh, to go to you again on, 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 on this topic, um, to the co we've, we've talked about the benefits of it and, and, and the speed at which uh, these solutions are being adopted into the commodities world. Talk to us a bit about um, the digital tools and, and analytics that, that you see, how much that's impacted the commodities industry. I know you don't just work, uh, you know, specifically on the trading side, but but again, the speed of this, I mean, is the, is the, is the most important factor of having this data on hand to do with scope or speed or scale? You know, where does it come in most useful? I think the, the key thing is it allows us to do more with less, right? I think this is this is the, the, the key thing. Now, what was is interesting is the growth in data scientists, the growth in you know data engineers, you know, who are managing data pipelines. Um, this this is this is growing. So so like it's it's not that it, people are gonna reduce, people are shifting from from more of the physical commodities to, to the knowledge-based aspect through the use of technology. Now, um, and, and the technology, really what it does is it augments decision-making, right? So it helps, you know, that, that's what it's about. It's about augmenting decision-making. Um, you know, the, the models themselves are, yes, you can get in Python and you can do it very quick. You can, you and, and it is going to be, you know, more of the independent guys who are out of the network because, Large organizations are really still struggling because they've got yeah. their core platforms, right? And you're offering services, you know, on, on one core platform and you've got some legacy technology. You cannot just move that there. You know, like what, what you see is in, in the banking and on the trading sector, um, a lot of times is people have to create a separate digital solution, mm -hmm. almost like a separate, because the services 
cannot go from one platform to another platform. So, so there is a lot of challenges that are occurring within this. I think where the speed is, is, is there, but I think what's really going to hit us in, in the next few years is we're going to see consumers, right? So, so people are, are, are living longer. There's going to be more people in the world, but consumers are now wanting more sustainable type products. And if you look at commodities from oil to metals, you know, all the way, all the way through, these are not energy efficient. And I think with the host of data, I actually think what's going to start coming is people are going to want to see green commodities. People are going to want to see what's the carbon footprint across that supply chain, right? So it's not just now that I'm investing, I will invest a little bit more. So for example, you know, the actual commodities themselves are about 15% of the total cost, right? The cost is in the marketing, the sales, the supply yeah. chain, all of that. To go green is only an extra 2% on, on the thing. And I, we, you know, I see that consumers are going to want to see more data. So it's not just going to be, what is the price? What is the price? What is the environment? We call it environomics. What is the environomics against it? Because, because we, I, you know, I'm seeing consumers want to pay more. They will pay more for a green product. And this is happening. And if you look at oil markets, you know, it's, it's been massive and it's really being impacted. At the same time, you know, 30% of greenhouse gases come from, you know, materials, steel, you know, your, your transportation, right? So, so there's all of this huge amount there. And I think we're not fast enough to be able to, to measure and monitor that. We're still, we're still focusing on what people wanted before. We're not focusing on now. And I think the real opportunity is there is to be able to provide these solutions. Hey, this is my price of gold. Hey, but by the way, this gold that you're getting here is a little bit more because it's got a better environomics scale. Well, I mean, you mentioned environomics. So can energy traders, I mean, or, or commodities traders, sorry, not just energy, uh, can, can, can they reinvent themselves? Can the, can the sector reinvent itself fast enough to, to meet these requirements. You talk about green, yes, the whole sector is shifting, it's in transition. We have the whole, from the finance financial community point of view, the ESG judgment, if you like, uh, towards investment, and we'll go to better for that for some commentary on that. So, and you know, clearly banks are becoming more picky about what they loan to and what kind of projects and, and putting a green label on everything, but can the commodity trading industry Peter, perhaps that question is a good one for you. Reinvent itself enough to meet these new sort of green uh, directives, and 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 you know, are, are there tangible green directives to meet really in your business? Well, from our side, uh, first off, I'll, I'll say this: from the, the market will will adjust and will do whatever is required that for its own survival. So there's the, there's the first side. So I think that it will adapt and it'll be dynamic and it, let's just see what, how things roll out over the next two to five years. But I'm sure that the markets will be very much ahead of the curve and not behind it. There's the first part. As far as the trading, uh, the traders themselves, they'll look for opportunities. Mm. That, that whole storyline, as far as the side that we sit on, they, they're only interested in identifying market trends through the best possible cause and profiting from it. It's as simple as that. That's the game that they're in. And that's what hedge funds are in. That's what speculators do. And the market needs those other people on the other side of the market. You know, the, the commercials need the speculators and they're the people that, you know, yeah. take the risk. Better, thanks, uh, Peter. Better, um, Morgan was mentioning about the whole uh, sort of systems within within companies you know when you're transitioning obviously from one to another when you're bringing in new technology and, and, and new versions of digital data uh, programming obviously as you said the finance sector is, is, is has been going through that for a while and is continuing to do um, you know you see fintech companies being being sprouting everywhere obviously posing a challenge to, to companies like Mashrik in terms of the solutions that they're providing and uh, some of the solutions. So how, how critical is it that the banking sector moves fast? And are there any lessons that you've learned uh, that, that, that sort of pure commodities uh, companies can learn from in terms of uh, adoption of digitalization of your systems within, within the corporate uh, entity? Yes, uh, I think it's, uh, it is fairly evident that the evolution that is happening in the financial sector 
um, as a result of the changed business dynamics. Um, as an institution, we have um, sort of embarked on a massive uh, sort of program where the entire bank's business model is being developed around this new uh, way of doing business. Um, as, I, as I sort of uh, alluded to earlier, we are like the um, commodity traders providing a certain service to our clients. And that is all geared around the, the, you know, their requirements and the customer experience. So what the financial institutions are trying to do around this in, in, uh, entire sort of uh, uh, business model is to map out the customer experience and the client's requirements uh, end to end. Uh, and that is where the use of digital uh, technology, automation, AI is being adopted throughout each touch point of the journey. Uh, from the very opening of an account for a corporate or for an individual to the entire uh, sort of stream of activities that can be done with the counterparty. So those are trade transactions. Those are you know, your, your corporate uh, solutions. Uh, and those are all being changed or evolved uh, to benefit from the evolution in technology. Um, I, I go back to Peter's point that the essence of what is being delivered is or is, is being provided is the requirement of, uh, of the buyers and the sellers. Um, in, with respect to commodity traders, the evolution that they will witness is what the national oil companies will be, will be producing. Their evolution towards greener hydrocarbons or you know uh, or or better managed hydrocarbons is a product that they will carry to the consumers now that journey will have will be more to with uh, in, in inclination inclination towards digital platforms to manage costs to make them more efficient to to spot opportunities within the flows so you know the underlying business dynamic will remain the same. It's the, it's the, let's say the the dressing of the business that is going to evolve has to be around digital uh, technology. Yeah, Dr. Stefan, um, in terms of how this all impacts impacts wholesale energy trading, uh, and also opens the doors for others to, to come in to the sector, if you like. I mean, technology has always been argued that it can lower barriers to entry, it, it decreases costs, you obviously have to invest it in the first place, but do you see these processes allowing more participants in your, in your sector? Is that happening or is it actually a, creating a barrier to those that aren't in the game already? What's it doing in terms of impacting the competitiveness, if you like? within the energy trading uh, world? Mm. Now, it, it depends a little bit. I'm, I'm not sure that I understood your question now correctly. So if it's about the energy trading world, actually, uh, and not our wholesale customers, um, then I think uh, it makes for competitors, uh, it, it makes it maybe even a little bit more difficult, I have to say. I mean, I, I would wish for because competition is always good yeah. for the market, right? Um, but um, my gut's feeling tells me you, because it becomes more and more complex and you need better understanding of how the markets interact into technology and how you pair up with technology, um, that is on a barrier. And on the other side, on making it easier, you have the availability of data, which certainly yeah. makes entry easier. And we will see how it plays out um, but I'm seeing at least where, where I'm currently um, uh, active, I'm seeing that the technology and the complexity around it and putting everything together is, um, you shouldn't neglect it. It's quite a significant part. Um, but then we, we can see that there may be other markets that open up suddenly as an opportunity, uh, which you haven't even thought about. Morgan, on that same question uh, of, of competitiveness, if you like, is, 
is the use of these tools and data analytics, digitalization, um, AI, et cetera, which you know, are available to anyone who, who, who chooses to understand them and implement them in their business. Is it opening up competition in the commodities world or are the established players speeding ahead, if you like, uh, because of these solutions? Well, I mean, it, what I'm seeing is the established players are kind of actually slower adopters. So it was mentioned that the you know some of the fintechs are are are, are, are yeah. trying to you know move in. Of course, some places now treat them as a traditional bank, as in the, the part of the world where we, we're here. So there's 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 barriers to entry for them. But you know when you've got your core platforms, the you can't just necessarily so so you've got security issues. So yes, I can get a whole bunch of libraries from Python to put in and, you know, but, but the large organizations won't allow that because cybersecurity is, 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 a, is a key, is a massive thing, right? So, so this is where they're going to be challenged between upstarts who can take existing models, right? And, and, and really work on them really, really fast. The data is, is out there. I think now where the, the traditional players have their advantage is they have access to what I would call hidden data. So they have access. So if you talk about energy trading, those supply chains, those are, are hidden, right? It's not, they're not transparent. There's fragmented control. And that data inherently is with the big players in the minds of the experts, not the machines. The machines mm -hmm. are looking at patterns to say that there, there's connections there. But I believe with more availability of data opening up across the supply chain, you know, there is a massive potential for somebody on a laptop, right? Just so you understand, on a laptop to run really advanced models and outbeat somebody because they are not stuck with the security controls, with the compliance controls, which allows them to, to, to really do transformation, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where the evolution will come or the revolution will come from. And then, of course, the big players are always on an evolutional step. I mean, this is, this is traditional. I mean... Um, and I think this is this is what will happen because you know more companies are becoming digital. There's a fight for digital talent. There's a recognition that now you know digital companies have the best valuation. Um, so there is going to be this this thing. But I think the competitiveness comes from uh, I think Peter mentioned it. You know, like hungry people who have curiosity. You know, they they can go in. They can they they like playing with data, right? So of course traders they they like playing with data. But the curiosity to, to, to try new things, to look at things, look at models that may have worked in other places, then build upon it. I think this is where the speed is, is, is going to come. And then the big players who are in control of those barriers a little bit, right, they will then eventually start taking those skills and taking that capability through, you know, mergers and acquisitions, you know, bringing, bringing that in to, because once you go to a full digital platform, Right, mm -hmm. it's it's based upon where you can bring APIs in, so you can bring in new new technology. So, yeah, yeah. So once you have made that first step to have a true digital open platform yourself, it's then very easy to bring in this new capability. But for the organizations that are not there yet, which are slower to move because they, they, they're working at scale, it, it, for them it is going to be an evolution. The revolution will happen with you know, for example, one of our data scientists. He's sitting and playing. You know, he's made models. And they're 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 crushing it on like Bitcoin, which may be a new type of commodity. Who, who knows? But they're crushing it on these kind of trading because they're not confined by that market knowledge assist. That the barriers don't exist for them. But the big organizations still do have that inherent access to wider data, which will, of course, when they get scale, make them them bigger. But the curiosity can be can be on the ground, and it might be somebody on it or, or companies that you don't know about. Peter, on the, in terms of the trading value chain, I mean, you know, uh, uh, trading houses, they do obviously, the, there's the before, during and after, if you like, a trade, right? And, and the decision making that goes into that and then the, 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 the strategy that comes perhaps after. How, wh which part of, of that trade value chain do you think this, the, these analytics uh, uh, and solutions are having most of an impact on? Is it sort of the pre-trade or is it in portfolio management once you've sort of made decisions on, on, on your strategy or even in the management of, of, of funds, if you like, once once the money is made. Is there a distinction along that value chain and trading? Uh, I don't know if there is a distinction. If I, you look at the retail side and what they do as far as expert advisors on their FX trading, 
So these are setting up trades and identifying times to enter naturally and how long you're in the market, reversals. We all understand how volatile the markets are and how quick turnarounds, you know, you're, you're, you're watching the market at six o'clock a.m. Sydney time and New York's going to close in, you know, another hour. And you go and take a cup of coffee and, you know, maybe have a shower and come back and all of a sudden crude's down 40 cents, crude's down 80 cents. What the hell happened in that last, you know, and 15 GameStop, minutes or eight minutes? And GameStop is up. It's not, it's not a commodity. Yeah, well, some other, some exactly. other stock has gone crazy, yeah. Exactly. And what we've seen in the last year is really highlights. One can't get our mind away from two key points. First off, around about the 3rd or the 2nd of J uh, July in 2008, crude hit 147 or so a barrel. In 13 weeks, it traded at about 34 or 35 bucks. It just, you couldn't, def no one could have written that script. So there's the first part. So these big monstrous moves and what we've seen in, that's the first part. The second part is what we've seen in the last year. The volatility has been mind blowing. We've yeah. seen negative crude at 38 bucks in the red. And then we go all the way. So how the hell does that happen? And then all of a sudden now we're at $72, 73 bucks. And people are saying, is there an 80 handle by July? So, you know, the, the big moves, this is what this industry is all about. And I don't think that that volatility is going to, going to disappear or dissipate. So in answer to your question, it's a, and it's a long-winded response, every component of the, of, the, of the value chain to trading needs to have a very focused attention span. Okay, thanks, Peter. Uh, Dr. Sorry. Stefan, to you, I mean, as, as, as we wrap up, actually, I'd like to, again, the, the title of this discussion is Future Landscape of Commodities Trading. We're talking about what, where we're at, what's happened and what's accelerated in the last year or two, in the last decade as well uh, sort of the over horizon view of or over the horizon viewpoint for you dr stefan on, on what's next i mean what 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 don't we have today in in the digitalization solution world that you think is coming next or should or is needed or is required or or indeed is that the fact that we have to take a bit of a step back and slow down your views on that next step um, well well that's a difficult question i mean if i would exactly know what's next and i had these crystal balls yeah. <laughs> then i'm probably a very rich what's, man what's your wish list probably. yes uh, so yeah. i think when I, I think how the uh the way how we work and how the markets will develop it will be just that working with these kind of technologies that we have mentioned today um if it's call it machine learning call it and then the data on it and, and all that we mentioned it will be nothing special anymore i mean think 20 years ago uh you were maybe not you but some of us we're celebrating the day that and go home and say, I sent an email today. You know, this is really impressive to my colleagues. Yeah. Uh, um, I had a telephone conference. And now look, look now, um, we are annoyed by email. So it's it has changed quite a bit. And I think that's what's going to happen. So a lot of the technology things which we are now talking about and, and think what's, what's coming is uh, going to be uh, going to be totally normal. The interesting thing is, it's, from my perspective, it's going to be so much faster to come than we expect. So uh, it's not going to be another 20 years. And then there comes another good idea that I sadly enough don't know yet. Um, but I'm sure the next big thing is going to come. Morgan, what about you? What's in your, in your world uh, of, of, of business? What do you think is next? What is the, what's on the horizon and what do we need to speed up? Well, I think what's, what, what's, what's there is going to be the increase of two types of technologies. One is symbiotic mesh AI, where the AI and the features of the machine start, and the predictions start feeding into other predictions, which start feeding into other predictions, which start then having automated control. So then it really starts to become a system that, that talks and responds there. I think this is, this is the next level, is a symbiotic mesh AI, right? That's one. And then the second part is, is really quantum computing because mm -hmm. quantum computing doesn't fit every type of um, evaluate. You know, it doesn't work for everything, right? But it works really, really incredible for, for, for certain aspects that are perfectly geared up for specifically commodity trading because you want to know what those differences. And of course, you're in this new 3D world because you got quid bits, right? Um, and that, that new dimension, I think, is really going to be the one that's on, on the horizon is going to shape things and you see the, the, the key to all of this is people are starting to get 
machine learning. So, so you will have the experts from, from 20 years ago. They're looking at the marking. They, they know the patterns that go. The machine is going to learn patterns that, that we don't understand, right? So then you're going to have the data scientists who are not necessarily looking at the main objective. They are looking what the data is telling them in patterns and shift in, in volatility. And it may, there may be those connections that we don't necessarily see, we don't understand. And you may need, you know, it's, it's a new, it's a really new skill set. And then when you start putting that symbiotic mesh AI into it, where it starts feeding, this is where I think we still don't know exactly where it is. So what we think machine learning is and all this, this will become ubiquitous. You know, it, it is in essence in many ways. But the new thing for me is now when that starts speaking together, these models interact with each other and have that symbiotic network. And then that use of quantum, which is then hitting those other, other things where there is limitations in compute, you can't do parallel runs. I think this is going to, to, to do it. And I think we are still five to 10 years away exactly. from truly understanding what that impact is going to be, right? Um, and, and I think that's the key part is we don't necessarily... That's why if you had a crystal ball, we'd all be gazillionaires. Yeah, we don't right? know, course, but what, we, what we're foreseeing. Yeah, thanks, Morgan. But just to go back to you and, and to wrap up, really, with your concluding comments, but on that point of, you know, the extrapolation, what's going to happen over the next five, 10 years and how machine learning and, and, and machine communication and quantum uh, computing, which I know nothing about, but how that uh, accelerates. In the financial sector, is there a concern, and then, and then please answer my question and, and, and use that to, to, to wrap up our session. We, we mentioned it, I think, but we didn't really get into that. Of course, cybersecurity has, is, is a huge um, uh, area where, where in, in, in the field of energy, obviously, and operationally, and obviously on the trading front as well, and on trading platforms. But from a financial sector point of view, uh, again, so the security, all these solutions, all these automated uh, efficiencies that, that we're all adopting. Um, and of course, in tandem, you as a bank are developing your security measures as well. But how much of a concern is that for financial institutions today? Are, are, are the security measures being able to keep up with, 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 with the other side, if you like, that's pulling you forward? So the, the challenges and the concerns are definitely uh, significant. But the fact is that that digital te technology automation is the answer as well. Uh, and I will give you a very simple example, blockchain, you know? Yeah. It, it, from a financial institution point of view, that provides what financial institutions are looking for is the visibility and access of information and its integrity, right? So as financial institutions, we are very keen to adopt and partner with uh, the relevant industry stakeholders in making sure that their business is well integrated with uh, the financial institutions. The fact that you have, um, as Morgan mentioned, fintechs coming in and trying to, you know, you know, put out solutions which you know are probably a challenge for conventional financial institutions to adopt. A lot of uh, global banks, including Maastricht, have taken on partnerships and collaborations with fintechs to be ahead or to be able to be you know, at par with the technology. And that's where the likes of Mitigram, uh, then you have Com Comgo, those solutions are being pushed very aggressively with the financial institutions to be able to support the evolution. So I think the answer is within the uh, within the new uh, business uh, dynamics, uh, it's about fine tuning it. It's about making sure that the 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 bezel whistles are addressed both from a regulatory perspective as well as protecting the interests of all concerned parties, be it you know yeah. our counterparties, the regulators, and all those. And that's the journey that we need to sort of take. And that's a very good point on the regulation. We didn't really get into that very much, but again, the protection of, of established sectors. Obviously, you talked about partnerships. You've got the whole big tech companies out there, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, who are who are buying up and investing in your sectors very Absolutely. quickly uh, and either buying the expertise or joining it or partnering with it. And that's, that's, again, going to, going to push everything forward 
uh, even even faster. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Bedar Chowdhury again from Mashrik Bank for hosting this webinar for us. Uh, it's been fascinating to have your points of view. So thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you so much. Pleasure meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.